In the previous video, we saw a non-preemptive shortest job first. In this video, we are going to look at the preemptive shortest job first algorithm. Preemptive means that if the CPU has been given to a process, but another process comes which has a CPU burst time less than what is remaining of the running process, then the new process will be given the CPU. That means the CPU can be taken away from a process which is running provided the condition of uh, less CPU burst time is satisfied. So, since the remaining time of the running process is checked with the new process which has arrived, this is also referred to as the shortest remaining time first or SRTN. So, when we will take this example, you, this th these things will be more clear. So, first let us see what is the status at time 0. We can see that there is only one process which has arrived at time 0 in the system which is P4. So, P4 will be allocated the CPU and P4 will start running. Now, at time unit 1, the process P3 arrives in the system over here. So, P3 arrives and the burst time of P3 is checked with what is the remaining time of the running process P4. So, the burst time of P3 is 8 and the remaining time of P4 is 2 because the total burst time was 3 and P4 has already run for one time unit. So, its burst time which is remaining is 2. Now, if we compare 2 with 8, we will find that P4 has the sh shortest remaining time. So, P4 will continue running and P3 will be put in the ready queue. So, now P3 comes in the ready queue and its burst time is 8. Now, at time unit 2, we see that process P1 arrives. So, P1 arrives at time unit 2 and it has a burst time of 6 and the remaining time of P4 because it has run for one more time unit. So, now the remaining time of P4 is 1. So, when we compare 1 with 6, we see that again P4 has the shortest remaining time or shortest job which is remaining. So, P4 continues to run and P1 is also put in the queue and we know that the burst time of P1 is 6. At 3, P4 completes its CPU burst and now P4 is out of the system. So, P4 is out of the system now. Now, out of the remaining processes in the ready queue, the burst time of P3 is 8, burst time of P1 is 6. So, P1 is given the CPU. So, now P1 starts running. At time 4, we have another process arriving in the system which is P5. At this moment, the burst time of P5 is 4 and for P1, since it has run for one time units, its burst time is 5. So, 5 is compared with 4 and we see that P5 has the shorter burst time now. That means P5 will be given the CPU and P1 is now put, so this had gone earlier, now P1 is put back into the ready queue and its time burst which is remaining is 5, P5 starts running. Now at 5, another process is arriving which is P2 and P2 arrives over here the burst time of P2 is 2 
and the burst time which is the remaining time for P5 because P5 was running it has already run for one time unit. So, its remaining time is 3. If we compare 3 with 2 we see that P2 has the P2 is the shortest job. So, now P2 will be given the CPU and P5 will be put in the ready queue and its remaining time is 3. Now P2 starts executing and the burst time of P2 is 2. So, it will run for 2 time units and finish off at 7. In the meantime, no other process has come. Now P5 will start running because out of the processes in the remaining queue, we have P5 which has having the shortest CPU burst time. So, P5 will run and run till 10. Then out of P3 and P1, P1 will be allocated the CPU, it will run for 5 time units and then P3 will be given the CPU and it will run for 8 time units. So, this is the Gantt chart that has been prepared for the preemptive SJF. Again, Gantt chart is the timeline of the CPU and this shows the processes which run on the CPU at different intervals of the time. If we see the wait time for P1, we see that P1 got the CPU at time unit 3, but it had arrived at time unit 2. Apart from that, it had to wait from 4 to 10 again to get the CPU. So, again there was a wait time from 10 to 4. So, the total wait time for P1 becomes 7. For P2, it got the CPU at time unit 5, but its arrival time was also 5. So, it did not have to wait at all. So, its wait time is 0. For P3, it got the CPU at 15, its arrival was at 1. So, wait time is 14. For P4, it arrived at time 0, got the CPU at 0. So, wait time is 0. Now, let us see for P5. P5 got the CPU at 4 time unit and it arrived at 4. So, initially its wait time was 0, but after releasing the CPU over here, it had to wait from 5 to 7 again to get back the CPU. So, again the wait in the ready queue was of 2 time units. To compute the average waiting time, we take the total of all these and divide it by the number of processes to get an average wait time of 4.6. Similarly, you can compute the turnaround time assuming that this was the only CPU burst and the process is terminated after this. Then only we can compute the turnaround time. So, this is the arrival time and let us say that after this burst all the processes they finished. So, for P1, the P1 process ends at time unit 15 and it arrived at 2. So, the turnaround time was 13. For P2, it ended at 7, arrived at 5. So, turnaround time is 2. For P3, the process terminated at 23, had arrived at 1, so 22. And similarly for P4 and P5, so average turnaround time would be the sum of all of these divided by the number of processes which gives you 9.2.